You're listening to Upstream with Shane Morris on the Colson Center Podcast Network. Welcome to Upstream. I'm Shane Morris. How do Christians lose their faith? What's the process that leads people out of a religious upbringing and into agnosticism or even atheism? What causes young people to turn from the faith of their parents? And then an equally important question, what happens in the heart and mind of someone who later returns to the faith? How does that happen, and how can we help it along as Christians? Well, I'm talking today with someone who has seen both sides of this process, who's been there and back again, as it were, from faith to scornful unbelief, and then back to Orthodox faith. Eric Huffman is the founder and lead pastor of The Story Houston, which is a church, and a host of the Maybe God with Eric Huffman podcast. He's got an MDiv from St. Paul School of Theology, and he's the author of a couple of books, including 40 Days of Doubt and the forthcoming Scripture and the Skeptic. His story, I think, can help us really figure out how people exit and then decide to re-enter the church. Eric, welcome. It's great to have you on Upstream. Thank you, Shane, so much. It's good to be here. So tell us a little bit about your story. You grew up in a conservative home, but you ended up losing your faith in college. What pulled you away from belief? How did you end up, as you put it, uh, rolling your eyes at Christianity? Yeah, good question. I did grow up in a very conservative part of the country, um, northeast Texas, Bowie County. I mean, just as red as red can be. And I grew up in church, constantly in church and uh, in the Christian world. You know, it's uh, had a very defined worldview growing up, but it wasn't a worldview where questions were always welcome and wrestled with in an honest um, or intellectual way. And so as thankful as I am for that upbringing and for my parents and for the church I grew up in and and everything. I think they all did the best they could. I, I just think the world shifted so quickly that um, upbringings like mine, churches like mine, um, were not equipping young people to be sent into the belly of the beast, into colleges and universities. And that is where sort of the, the rubber met the road for me. And all the smartest people I knew all the people I wanted to be with or be like um, were rejecting Christianity or had long ago rejected Christianity and had very seemingly very good intellectual grounds on which to do that. And so uh, I didn't ever have anyone really defending Christianity in an intellectual way that made sense to me. And so I was, you know, like a lot of students in colleges, I was defenseless hmm. in, in terms of my um, my intellectual um, makeup at the time to really argue with what I was hearing about how Christianity had been more of a, an evil than a good and how the Bible had been a force for oppression and how white men had basically co-opted Christianity and, and um, dominated the world with Bibles in their hands. So that was, uh, it was obviously a, a turning point for me. I remember my professor walking, the most popular professor in the religion department, walking into class with a, a meme kind of on his shirt, his t-shirt that was making fun of Christianity, just how, um, in his words, uh, ludicrous and absurd it is to believe that a cosmic Jewish zombie rose from the grave, you know, all that stuff. And I, I remember thinking, I don't want to, I don't want to be one of those people that believes that stuff. I want to be better than that. I want to be smarter than that. And that was the beginning of the journey. So this wasn't one of those uh, conversions where you had a bad experience in your home church or with your family and you sort of rejected it for, for those reasons. It was because we like to distinguish between people who are, who are who are coming up with intellectual justifications for a deconversion that was that was really about something else and those who, who genuinely ran into intellectual problems uh, like like what you're describing. No, I'll be honest. I my experience with Christians and Christianity was was positive. And obviously, I mean, I, I check off all the boxes, I guess, in terms of what folks might say about that. I'm, I'm straight, white, male, whatever. And, you know, and, and so, of course, it was positive for me. But, but I remember I, my part of my upset with the church was, uh, was more by proxy. I, I, I was informed that, unbeknownst to me all those years, the church had been oppressing people that I cared about mm. and, um, and doing harm, doing damage to those people. And so I, um, I think part of what's good about the way God made me is that I, I have a big heart and I, I genuinely care um, for people. I, I, empathy is a gift. And, 
And so I thought, wow, the church has done all of this harm. I don't want to be a part of that. Like, mm-hmm. I, want to, I want to do better. You made up a creed of your own when you were 21. Give us the outlines of that. Yeah, well, the first part of that, I think, was um, whenever I was in a religious setting in in those days and we would do the Apostles' Creed, uh, as we often do in Methodist churches, and I would pick and choose. (laughs) I I would choose the lines that I still believed and and not say. And, and, you know, the longer time went on, the less of that creed that I said, because I just started to believe less and less of it. But basically my my personal creed became one of I, what you would call now social justice wokeism kind of i mm. and i don't mean that pejoratively i i mean that's uh that that was my highest ideal at the time was making the world a more just place for oppressed people and i thought that's what god was trying to say in the bible all along and christians messed it up mm. and so you know that ideal was still there and i could still use the bible to justify that ideal even though i didn't really believe in the god who was behind it i still used it for political reasons and i just believed that it was time for society um to change to reflect a more fair equitable just world which to my mind at the time no longer but at the time looked like um looked like top-down socialism uh, government mandated um, socialism where everyone's equal start to finish. And so uh, I was ignorant at the time, but that's, that's kind of what I believed in. You know, the only part of the creed that we ever have trouble with as uh, conservative Presbyterians in my church is the dissensus clause. You know, some people are like, ah, I'm not sure that's in the Bible, but ev- everything else yeah, we're, we're fine with saying it's we don't. It's optional. You know, that one's uh, <laughs> that one's asterisked. You know, it's uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you can say that one Al- along with the Holy Catholic Church asterisk. Yeah, no, we never said Catholic in my <laughs> church growing up. We always said universal instead. But what did you believe about Jesus at this point in your life? Uh, I conceived of Jesus, uh, during my deconversion as a really cool hippie (laughs) who said some great things and, and was probably not, or was definitely not who Christians say he is, but even probably not who the world thinks he was. Um, I just more radical, um, I had all kinds of ideas about queer theory and stuff back then that I remember buying into um, that I'm frankly ashamed of now. And I I don't even like talking about it too much, but that's where our professors were guiding us. There was no doubt that um, they wanted to instill in us this belief that Jesus was somehow um, sexually queer for lack of a better term. And, and uh, that was the term they used. And so all of these weird ideas were instilled in me, you know, cause he wasn't married. He was a single adult Jewish male, which is rare and strange. Right, sure. Right. That doesn't mean he, you know, anyway, it's, it's strange to look back now just to see how brainwashed I was, but it truly was a, a thorough brainwashing. So what did, it, what ended up bringing you back? You describe a, a trip to Israel that changed the picture for you. What happened there? that challenge yeah. this really confident, smart aleck skepticism. Because <laughs> that's, that's a word you've used before. Yeah, yeah, I still use it about myself all the time. <laughs> that part hasn't changed, unfortunately. Um, no, I think before the trip even, I started to see the cracks in the foundation of my leftist, sort of politically leftist worldview. And I started to realize that all the things that I said I hated about religious people or the religious right i was seeing on the left i was seeing the rigid judgmentalism i was seeing these kinds of hateful witch hunts i was seeing um people being uh, excluded from the community because they didn't follow the party line like all those things that i thought we were not about on the left i was seeing creep in and so uh, and i saw this kind of um man this is tough but i saw this kind of latent racism Mm. on the left in my world anyway that prided itself on being anti-racist but um through the soft bigotry of low expectations was in fact deeply racist and i was picking up on all that and i knew there was something else for me before the holy land trip and then i was presented with an opportunity to go and study the evils of zionism um over and against the palestinians in 2013 i went and um by virtue of a little trip to capernaum i was confronted with some evidence that 
rocked me, frankly. Hmm. And it's funny, you know, like Shane, looking back on that, I don't know why I was so surprised to find out what I found that day. But again, it speaks to the brainwashing, right? So what I had been told about Jesus is that his divinity was, was made up. It was fabricated in the aftermath of his death. Why? Maybe it was a power grab. Maybe his, his disciples just didn't want to let him die. Hmm. And so they created a myth around him in the generations that followed. And his divinity, I was told, wasn't even cemented as part of his myth until Constantine right. in the Edict of Milan. I remember that as clear as day that I, that I believe that. The universal whipping boy of, of skeptics is Constantine, oh, right? Yeah, exactly. He put together the and Bible, he made Jesus divine. <laughs> you know, right. And had I just thought critically, I could have simply looked at the Bible itself and seen enough evidence at least to understand Jesus believed he was God hmm. and have to grapple with that. But I was taught and led to believe, and I accepted to my own you know, shame, I accepted that Jesus never said or really believed he was God. That, that was somebody else sort of imparting that or, or uh, superficially sort of laying that on to him after the fact. But Paul's letters were written before the Gospels. That's something else we learned in seminary. And Paul's letters refer to Jesus as God, you know, repeatedly and undoubtedly. And so there's no way to get around the fact that Jesus and his believers, his disciples believed he was God. They worshiped him. Hmm. Anyway, I didn't, that none of that registered with me. I end up in Capernaum. I'm at the shoreline in Capernaum, which is a beautiful place. If you've never been there, you got to go check this place. Out. I have been there. It was years ago, but it was, oh. uh, it was a beautiful spot for sure. Oh, I, I'll never forget it. And I was finally able to go back again this year, right before COVID. And, and I had the same kind of moment there. But here's what happened. I'm in Capernaum at the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee. It's not a big place. And so when you read about the events in the Gospels that take place in Capernaum, you can very easily visualize where all this is happening. Hmm. So there's the story in Mark where Jesus pulls the boats in with his disciples at the shoreline, and he is confronted by Jairus, the synagogue leader, whose daughter is sick, 12-year-old daughter is sick, and he's headed to uh, heal her before she dies. And he's interrupted by the woman with the issue of blood who touches the hem of his garment, and she's healed after 12 years of bleeding and being isolated from her family and community. And then he turns and in a moment where everyone would expect a, a notable rabbi like Jesus to be furious with her because she's made him unclean on his way to heal a very important guy's daughter, which he can ceremonially no longer do now because he's unclean. And so he should just tell the, st the crowd to stone her. But instead he stops and the story says, he looked at her and she told him the whole truth, <laughs> which, so what's happening is my tour guide is telling me this story as I'm standing in the spot where this must have happened because I'm on the shoreline, the synagogue where Jairus worked and probably lived near, it's right 30, 30 yards away. Hmm. And then, you know, the house, the house church that that, that, that uh, spaceship looking church is built on top of right. is right just to my right. It's all right there. So I'm, my heart is just moved by the story because she tells him the whole truth. I don't even know how long that takes. Like how long a conversation is that? Or did Jesus just know it? Or I don't know. But, and then it says, Jesus called her his daughter, which is the only time he ever did that. He never called anyone else daughter. He called her daughter as a way of not just healing her body, but re- um, re, uh, redeeming her and restoring her to community again after 12 years. Mm. So after my heart is just torn up by that story, standing in the spot where that happened, our tour guide, who's now a really good friend of mine, he's an archaeology enthusiast, Bert Gary, he took us to the house church and he said there are these inscriptions on the walls of this house church where Christians were worshiping in the early church and this is probably the first house church we, we have and we know about. And on the walls of, these, of this house church are etchings that say, Lord Jesus Christ, God Jesus Christ, have mercy Jesus Christ, things like that. And I'm like, yeah, big deal. Like um, We all know that his believers, his disciples believed him to be, Jesus, him to be God, but that doesn't change anything. But then he said, 
and these some of these have been dated to as early as the first half of the first century. And at that point, my heart was primed right. and ready. <laughs> and I'm, re- I'm, I'm realizing, I'm putting it together. Wait, the people who knew him personally, people who lived with him and, and walked and worked and, and, uh, and did ministry with him, they, the people that knew him best, they believed he was something more than just a man. They believed he was God. And then many of them went on to die for that belief. And so at that point, there's no longer any possibility that it's about Constantine 300 years down the road. This was happening in real time. And these devout Jewish people whose Old Testament or Hebrew Bible says, worship no other gods before me, have no image before me, are worshiping a man as God. Is so uh, what does that mean? Uh, yeah, I think it's Jay Gresham Machen who points out a, a bunch of people do it, but he points out in uh, Christianity and liberalism that the historical Jesus that liberals are looking for uh, gets the, the time frame in which he could exist, the non divine Jesus, uh, becomes vanishingly smaller and smaller as you go back and look at the evidence. You've got a divine, a conception of a divine Jesus uh, in the earliest extant evidence from the new testament period um that lot that that basically almost touches his life and so you have to ask yourselves well how quickly did they cook up this whole divine jesus thing and what was the motivation for it and get everybody on the same page and yeah if you're going to cook up a myth cook up one that doesn't get you killed cook up one that doesn't get you you know excluded from your families Hmm. and you know this this guy was their god and that meant that life could never be the same and that they would end up stoned and on crosses and stuff like that so it just clicked for me and i i had this moment that i couldn't believe at the time that it was happening i just was overcome i couldn't breathe i was on the shore of the sea of galilee i was one foot in the water and i'm just like texting my wife and it's in the middle of the night back home <laughs> i'm oh, texting wow. my wife <laughs> my god it's all true it's real my god and, and she's getting this message not knowing what's going on <laughs> and so but i think that you just encountered an, a ufo or something yeah <laughs> right yeah who knows and but she had been praying for years for that to happen oh that's and, cool it was. Uh, it still took me a, a a year or two to work through some of the the kinks and and the, figure out some of the details. I'm still in that process. It was just seven years ago, um, but so much changed all at once in that day. It was one of those John Wesley heart strangely warmed kind mm. of moments. So how was that received when you came back home a different man? What what was the reaction when your skept when your smart aleck skepticism had melted mm-hmm. away and been replaced by this dumbstruck uh, you know newfound belief? Yeah. So from age twenty to thirty three, I had built my identity around that persona. So I was the cantankerous, rebellious, social justice warrior, protester, activist. Like I, conservative white Christians were the bane of my existence. And I mean, I have sermons, sermon that I preached back then that prove this, that and, and papers that I wrote and stuff that I had in, in uh, published and stuff. It, so hang on, you were preaching sermons as an agnostic, bro. I was, <laughs> I was licensed. Uh, a licensed pastor by the United Methodist Church. And I started a church called Revolution. And we all like wore black t-shirts and um, really angry scowls on our faces. <laughs> and we did a lot of protests and marches and for some good causes, right? So that's the other side of this. I don't want it to sound like we all just had fangs and we were demonic and all this. Like right. there were some really good things. We ran a soup kitchen. We ran a homeless shelter. Like <clears throat> We were fighting for a lot of good causes, but hmm. we were always burning out. We were always an unhealthy community. I was always an unhealthy leader. I had addictions and stuff in my life. Like my marriage was a mess. It was, it was clear to me that, that something was, was missing because I, I was living as though all that mattered was the output, hmm. as though all that mattered was doing enough good. Well, the problem when you live that way is you can never do enough good. That's the problem with, with woke culture now is we're seeing you can never, it's like Hebrews, <laughs> you know, year after year, day after day, sacrifice after sacrifice, and it's never enough. But Jesus died once and for all. And that's the difference Jesus makes. And, and that's the freedom that we find in, in Christ. So I don't even remember the question you asked me, bro. I'm getting fired up. Getting fired uh, up. About being an agnostic pastor. Oh, yeah. what, is, what does that look like? What's the motivation there? Oh, um, for me, the motivation was to have a platform to do the, the 
activism. Huh. It was politics. And for the United Methodist Church, I think the motivation was to feel relevant. Interesting. You know, uh, it's N.T. Wright, and I forget whether it's in his book, um, How God Became King or uh, Surprised by Hope. But he talks about, uh, he has this little vignette where he he gives us two pastors on opposite sides of town. There's one pastor who uh, who basically just preaches, you know, uh, come to Jesus, has an altar call at the end of every sermon, and he's just trying to get people saved. He's not interested in social activism. He's the Bible-thumping conservative. He's really just about getting people to say the sinner's prayer so they can, you know, get out of there and go to heaven. Uh, the other pastor on the other side of town, he describes as this guy who's richly and deeply uh, entrenched in social justice activism. He wants to make the world a better place. He wants to uh, to, to uh, confront poverty and bigotry and racism and sexism and, and the wage gap. And every you name the cause, he's in it. Um, but when it comes to preaching about the actual supernatural basis of Christianity, he's he's got nothing to say because he really yeah. doesn't even believe it. So he's got all the activism, all the all the you know um, the the things that he thinks would work out from Christianity. And yet he's got none of the the, the uh, theological foundation. And Wright says that he thinks that the fundamentalist preacher is actually closer to the truth than the other guy because he's got the facts. But he's he's also failing in that he's not working out the uh, fruits of that of those supernatural theological beliefs. And so he says yeah. what we should do is combine both approaches. Not that we should become social justice warriors, but that we should become deeply conscientious about uh, as Christians about the world around us and about the commands that Christ gave us to engage and care for that world. That's right. No, I agree with everything you just said. And I think the the problem with being Pastor B on the other side of town, the, uh, the social justice pastor is yeah. you can't help um, you can't really stop the the growth of bitterness in your in your soul um, because there's no place to take it. There's no place to take your angst other than just, you know, social media and be angry at Christians or something. And, and it just eats you alive. Now, the other guy who's preaching the gospel and doing an altar call, like if you're doing that genuinely, then what we believe is that the work of the spirit takes over and bears the fruit through us. And so um, we should be about works uh, of justice and, and things like that. Uh, very much. I, I'm more about that stuff now than ever, but I'm not doing it to prove something. I'm not leading people to do prison ministry in order to show how good they are or in order to, you know, make the world a better place, so to speak. It's bigger than that. We're doing that because the Holy Spirit's at work in us and because um, the, the vision the Bible gives us of the Holy Spirit's work is cultivation then the the bearing of the fruit isn't proof of anything it's a fulfillment of our created purpose mm. so to bear the fruit of the spirit is to essentially be who we were always meant to be to, to be who we were created to be um, and it's the work of the spirit and not our own goodness that does it eric if you could go back to uh i'm trying to think of the time frame here it'd be like about 2012 2011 2012 and talk to your younger self, what would you say to that man in the midst of his doubt? Mm. Because I think we draw we could draw a lesson from this on how to engage people today who are in the same place you were then. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Nobody's ever asked me that, <laughs> but it, it really hit me hard when you punched like punch me in the chest when you, when you asked me, um, I would, first of all, I, I think all of what I'm about to say is couched in some kind of, uh, hypothetical relationship that I have with younger me. <laughs> so the problem with, you know, talking sense into people sometimes is if there's not rapport, you won't get anywhere. Yeah. But, um, if I had a loving connection and, and mutual respect with, with me, <laughs> I, uh, I, some I back would, to the future stuff here, <laughs> yeah. I would say, um, you know, have you, have you, have you thought through your reasons for doubting? Have you, as you doubted your certainty, have you doubted your doubts and, um, have you, have you really given the Bible as close a look as, as you think? But even more than that, I think taking it out of the theoretical realm, man, it was so evident that my life was in shambles. 
and that I was, you know, I was messed up in porn and I was an angry guy and depressed. I was, I mean, part of my conversion involved actually seeking help with depression. And I, I mean, I've, I'm in a great place with that, but it, it was, um, I, I think I would say, Hey, let's get real and talk about how you're really doing. And I think that personal concern would have given way to the more theoretical conversation. I, and I, I think without that, I don't think I ever would have gotten there um, to the theoretical stuff where it's so evident that my arguments were wrongheaded. But man. It sounds so much like uh, Tim Keller's approach in The Reason for God, where he not only does he say doubt your doubts, you know, he uses that phrase, but he also um, kind of tries to meet the skeptical social justice type where they are and say, and this is based on a long ministry in New York City, of course, at Redeemer. Um, but he, you know, he says, I understand that you have all these concerns about the world, uh, that you want to bring about justice and that you have all these ideas about Christianity. But let me, let me get to the root of why you think those things. And, yeah. and, and I want you to start asking yourself, what is it that you're really after? And why do you have this sense of justice about the world? Do you have a, a framework in which that makes sense or is you know he, he has those sort of personal conversations so that's right no it's and you know uh the reason for god was the first book i read when i came back from the holy land hmm. i had never heard of tim keller good choice that. good choice and i it, it was given to me i you know i'd never um even in seminary i we never talked about anything apologetics based we talked about a lot of like feminist theory and, and womanist theory. <laughs> Seriously, man, it's just like my seminary experience was liberation theology 101 and very little about apologetics, little about the Bible and stuff like that. So um, it was easy to be an agnostic in that setting. Let's talk about your book, 40 Days of Doubt, Devotions for the Skeptic. How would you describe or introduce this book to our listeners? And, uh, and who do you picture approaching this book and benefiting from it? Yeah, I mean, I really wrote the book the, like two years after I converted. So yeah. it was kind of a book to myself. I was writing these daily devotionals to people that were a part of my launch team for the story here in Houston. And so... Uh, 2015, 2016, I just started taking one question at a time, a question that had stuck with me or, or that had me stuck during that part of my life and addressing it from a, a biblical theological perspective. So I addressed 40 different questions, um, starting with questions about creation, uh, questions about Jesus uh, compared to other um, myths and legends, other kinds of comparative religion conversations. Uh, questions about the Bible, questions about sexuality and ethics, um, questions about uh, the human condition, suffering, stuff like that. So 40 different questions at their daily devotionals. And I don't think I knew it at the time, but I think the target for this book actually is um, not just people who are skeptics like I was or, or uh, people who are agnostics. It's actually most helpful for people who have friends who are. So I think the most positive feedback and response I've gotten for 40 Days of Doubt is actually from people who needed um, something to, uh, to resource their conversations with their friends and family members who were deep in doubt and um, struggling to believe. You know, another theme that emerged from a lot of the reviews as I was looking on Amazon and so forth uh, at the book is that it gives doubters this space to reevaluate the validity of the Christian faith, that, that concept of space uh, to ask questions kept coming up. Give us some examples of the, of the devotions in the book and how they offer that kind of space. Um, yeah. So, you know, I think the, uh, the space for doubters is like uh, the word I like to use is unassuming. So when someone encounters the book or when someone encounters my church now, I hope they find me and, and, and the culture at our church to be unassuming. Like, I don't assume I know what you believe or why. Mm -hmm. I don't assume I know uh, who you are or what's true for you. I, I'd like to start from scratch with you and, and get to know your story. And so I think by being vulnerable in that way, by telling my story of doubt and how I continue to have struggles once in a while, like in the book, I talk about a, a few areas where I, where I still once in a while, I'll go, wait a minute, 
do I believe this anymore? <laughs> uh, even now, and that's all right, you know. Like we don't have to be these sort of Teflon Christians that that uh, never absorb any doubt anymore. Um, we can be vulnerable and real, and in, in fact, it's when we're vulnerable and real about our doubts and struggles that real growth happens. And so um, I think we have to, instead of just saying that, I think we have to model it. And that's what I try to do uh, in, in the book. I talk a lot about the specific areas in which I have doubted, even so far as to say, Shane, like there are specific things that I believe now because I trust the Bible yeah. that I wish were not in the Bible. You know, like when you tell an unbeliever that, like there's stuff in there that I don't always love. I'm not super fond of, but yeah. I'm devoted to this God and I believe and trust his word. And so I, I you know, I, I go with it because his ways are better than mine. Um, but just the admission that, you know, some of this still struggle is, is still a struggle, I think is, I think is liberating for people. Where would you draw the line as a pastor when it comes to accommodating doubt in a church? And this is obviously a tough uh, subject, but when you're reaching out to unbelievers, to agnostics, to atheists, to to the deconverted, um, how do you distinguish between the the job of a church to pastor the flock and the job of of reaching out? I mean, how much doubt are you really willing to uh, entertain in sermons or in Bible studies or or what have you? Yeah, we uh, are figuring this out <laughs> as we go, I'll be honest. <laughs> However, I will say what we've learned is I think where the line there is, is, um, is leadership. Hmm. So, um, you know, a lot of churches draw that line at membership. And I'm not real sure why we ever got, as, as the body of Christ, why we ever got obsessed with membership. I don't see that as a, as a real biblical concept in terms of officially joining the institution. But uh, for the story, that is not a, uh, we, we try to remove that stumbling block. And so we want people to feel like they are fully fledged uh, members or a, at least a part of this community, like they belong to this community um, uh, w without having it all figured out. That doesn't mean that just anybody that, you know, has, uh, has the desire or shows potential to lead um, is given an opportunity. So we've become a lot more, um, a lot more stringent and discerning when it comes to who we uh, select and train and send to lead ministries, who we put on stage, for example, like during worship and stuff like that. Like that's where we tend to draw the line more. Um, and I think that's, I think that's a good direction for us. Um, it still comes with its share of conflicts because you have people who don't agree 100% with your core values or with what the Bible says, mm -hmm. who want to be fully accepted into them. Sometimes that means leadership. You have to have uh, hard conversations. So what's your, uh, I'm interested in the church practice here as far as membership and discipline or what the equivalent is in, in your church. And this is a United Methodist um, congregation, right? Or it's affiliated it with the Methodist church? Okay. Yes. So in So in this context, Eric, um, if someone wants to get baptized, for instance, how, what kind of membership vows or questions or, or, or hoops would you want that person to jump through to discern whether they really are converting to the faith? Yeah. Um, baptism is a, is a big, is a big issue for us. I mean, we take it very seriously. And so we have a whole class that you have to go through before, um, before you're baptized as an adult. And uh, we do infant baptism as well as Methodists. And, yeah, same, uh, same at my church. Yeah. And so you, the parents have to go through a whole class. To, uh, we don't do baptisms ceremonially or, uh, you know, as a show. Um, so, you know, it's, it's like uh, for adults, it's like a confirmation class. I mean, it, you go through the class, you affirm that, that you believe the basic tenets of the Christian faith. Um, our belief, uh, our core beliefs are listed on our website. It's basically the Apostles' Creed. I mean, it is the Apostles' Creed. Not, not the one you, you not wrote that for one yourself line. at 21. No, 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 not that either. No, the whole thing <laughs> minus descended into hell. That one's there you still go. in the air. We're not sure about that one. <laughs> that seems to be a common, a common problem for uh, evangelicals. You ask me, and I'm all about the harrowing of hell, baby. I'm, I'm I love all over it. that stuff. I <laughs> love it, but it does feel a little bit like fan fiction. I can't find yeah. it in the Bible. Like, <laughs> I mean, there's that that Second Peter thing. I think. Right, right. Uh, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's fun to think about. 
um, yeah, we, we take it very seriously and, and people, um, you know, for example, you, uh, profess your faith in Jesus as uniquely God incarnate. You profess your faith in Jesus as the, uh, exclusive way to salvation. Um, you, uh, profess your faith in the triune God, um, the work of the Holy Spirit, like all the, the basics are, are, uh, it, it's a pretty orthodox congregation for being one that's so open to skeptics. Right. Now, we've talked about uh, how a church deals with skeptics. Let's flip this on its head and talk for a moment about how, uh, uh, about how Christians deal with a skeptical church. Because I recently had uh, Elisa Childers on uh, the podcast, yeah. and, and, and she's got this new book, uh, Another Gospel, which is about liberal Christianity and her almost deconversion, where she encountered uh, a pastor who actually revealed he's an agnostic. He didn't, he didn't believe. And this was in the early stages of this church uh, sort of descending into a much more progressive mindset, a much more progressive mode of theology. And, uh, and so it raises the question in my mind, how much should a Christian be willing to put up with in a church? And I've talked to a number of friends recently who are sort of you know, hanging around in churches where they're flying rainbow flags and stuff and sort of just still going along with the historic liturgy and meaning it more than probably anyone else in the building. What, where would you draw the line there as, as a Christian? When should you run for the hills? Mm, man, that is so hard. I think part of it is, is circumstantial. Are you raising kids in this church? Mm. Um, and what stage of life are you in? What's the state of your faith? Are you strong enough to withstand some of the bad theology? Um, are you called as a missionary to that community? These are the kinds of questions that I wrestle with, with people that are in these communities more often than not, man, like once some of these lines are crossed, I guess I don't mean to be cynical, but I guess it just, I, I, I never see a comeback or a turnaround. Um, uh, you know, there's always, it happens. I get a new pastor or something tr dramatic happens, but it seems like once people accept the gospel of uh, social activism, it's it's uh, it's the point of no return. What about denominations? And I know this is a tough question for you as a uh, as someone in the Methodist tradition. There's we we have news you know recently of this decision to split the communion along the conservative and and liberal lines. Uh, how the yeah. influence of overseas members of the communion. Uh, is 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 pulling you know the Methodists back in a more conservative direction, but the ones here in North America tend to be much more liberal. Where, how would you deal with that on de on a denominational level? As much as you can say, you know, uh, being a pastor in that denomination, <laughs> um, <laughs> no one incriminate you. <laughs> I appreciate that. No, I have already. I'm a charter uh, signatory on the new Methodist. It's called the Global Methodist. A denomination, okay. a global Methodist church that is uh, going to be a more orthodox expression of Methodism. So that cat's out of the bag. Um, <laughs> I think that I think the sad reality, but it's it's also I think a blessing in disguise. I think these big steeple denominations are in the last throes of the life cycle. I think mm -hmm. God's doing something new and different. And um, the, the advantage to sticking around in denominations is there will be opportunities. If you're called to do this, there will be opportunities to take resources that denominations have and, and to um, invest them, whether it's buildings, people, money, whatever, invest them in this new thing God is doing. And that's happening like in Methodist churches. There, there are some real success stories of church plants and things like that that are doing next generation kind of stuff. Uh, the sad reality for pastors is uh, you start to feel locked into a system that's just in a tailspin and that is not life-giving. In fact, it's, uh, it takes from you. And uh, it, there's a suddenly a spirit of scarcity and a spirit of uh, paranoia and fear. And, mm -hmm. and none of that is conducive to, to spirit led ministry. So, you know, that's a hard one. It's a case by case basis. And the Methodist Church, you know, is a uh, I guess we have an opportunity here to see a new thing, be a part of a new thing. And so that's that's exciting. But I know not everybody's in that kind of situation. 
Well, you know, Eric, that fear-based mindset that you mentioned a moment ago that sets in, I think it's very, uh, it, it's, it's a vulnerability that conservative, you know, offshoot denominations like mine, the PCA, need to guard carefully against because your story to me is proof that there are plenty of people in these old mainline denominations that have gone liberal that that may still be completely open to turning around and re-embracing a much more orthodox and traditional expression of the faith. And, and to give up on them is dereliction of a, of a mission field. I mean, we have to cultivate a mindset to where we recognize the theological drift, but we also look at the people in those denominations as every bit uh, as much our mission field as, you know, the completely unchurched who may never have heard uh, the gospel before. Exactly. And my impression of conservative Christians was, going back to my skeptical days, was this sort of um, marriage, this unholy marriage of Christianity and politics. And my impression as a, as a liberal skeptic was to be conservative and Christian meant to be a Republican. And you have to always be Republican and you have to always criticize Democrats and liberals or whatever. And so um, I think what I discovered when I became a Christian in 2013, I went to a conservative Christian conference and, and the breakout sessions were some of the most open-minded and big hearted kinds of conversations that were happening. I had no idea that that was even happening. It was about like how to be warm and loving to, to LGBTQ people at your conservative congregation. You know, hmm. it's like, whoa, right. right you guys talk about this? And I was really surprised. And what that said to me is there are real openings. The Holy spirit can work where we find this common ground that excites skeptics and catches them by surprise when they hear Christians talking about it, skeptical liberal types, they need to hear Christians standing up for immigrants. For example, it's one example, mm -hmm. like, yeah. like biblically, no doubt about it, where we should be in terms of how we love immigrants and refugees, right? No yeah. matter how they get here. Like, because we're Christians first and Americans second or third or fourth or fifth or sixth, whatever. Like, the, the mandate to love and protect and defend the sanctity of every human life absolutely is there for Christians. But most liberal skeptics think conservative Christians hate immigrants. Why? I don't know. Bad messaging, maybe uh, just a, a narrative that took off or something, but we can do a better job of showing them what, who we really, who we really are. And I think in doing that, we start opening doors kind of like we have here at the story. God's doing it all over the country. We're coming up on the end of our time here, but I want to ask you about this new book that you have coming out next year. It's called scripture and the skeptic. What's yeah. that about? And, uh, and what are you trying to accomplish in that book that, that, that the previous book of devotions doesn't do? Yeah, it's a much uh, bigger work. So it's uh, it's twice the size of uh, Forty Days of Doubt. It is uh, fifty four thousand words, and and it's uh, it's really a, a treatise. I try to reclaim biblical inerrancy, but in a creative way. Uh, this is not something that any Methodist that I know of, other than a, a select few, ever really uh, want to say that they believe in biblical inerrancy because there's cloudiness, murkiness about what that term means. Right. So I want to reclaim the 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 idea that the Bible is perfect. It tells exactly the story God intended to tell, warts and all. Um, he intended to enter the the dirt and the muck of our creation and to get his hands dirty in the work of salvation uh, of saving us. And so uh it's a uh, it's really deals with the whole bible there's there's two chapters on just the book of leviticus <laughs> uh, where i'm talking about leviticus being the greatest love story of all time and uh and really oh, excellent yeah i hope it's a creative defense of of biblical inerrancy and in, in a way that uh, opens some eyes who, who do you think of as the ideal reader for this who's it aimed at I think it's aimed at people, two groups. So it's aimed at um, curious skeptics who actually have a deep appreciation for the Bible um, as literature, history, um, moral teaching, whatever. So we need and, to send a copy to Jordan Peterson right away. Uh, yeah, he would be a great, yeah. Let, let, let's get him on the back cover writing something for me. <laughs> uh, no, I. Uh, there's that. And then I also think there's people who are in these big steeple denominations that have not been um, encouraged to receive the Bible in its totality. There is a push in Methodist churches right now to see the Bible as uh, you can take it or leave it or take some of it and leave some of it. 
Hmm. the three buckets fallacy right now in the Methodist church. That's big. I don't know if you've heard about this, but the whole idea is you have one bucket for the true word of God. You have one bucket for it was good at its time and now it's no longer authoritative. And you have a third bucket, which is the stuff that's just trash. It was never meant to be in the Bible at all. And you can just do away with that and you get to decide. It's the canon within the canon, right? And you get to be the decider. Yeah, Yeah. you're the arbiter. It's great. All that power. (laughs) Um, But I I really want to push back against that um, because I think there's such value in the deepest, darkest, dirtiest parts of the Bible. Awesome. Well, where can my listeners find out more about your work and sort of uh, keep their eyes out for this book? Yeah. So there's the story dot church. That's my website, well, the church's website. And then there's maybe God dot com. That's my podcast, which uh, we don't put out as many episodes as you, man. Uh, you're prolific, but we're, <laughs> we're trying. We put out a, a really highly produced episode about once a month. And uh, we're about to release one right now with uh, an interview that I had with Randy Travis, the country music hall of famer about his faith cool. journey. Yeah. So maybe God dot com is a great place to find me there. Awesome. Eric, thanks so much for joining me today on uh, the Upstream podcast. This has been just a a really rich conversation and one that I didn't, I honestly didn't expect, I didn't see coming, but it fills a, uh, it it really fills a gap, I think, in the content we've had on this podcast and and in my own thinking on how to deal with, um, you know, the, the problem of doubt and the experience of Christians who have left the faith uh, or have left the Orthodox faith and then have come back and how we can sort of make that a reality for more and more uh, of this mission field that's often neglected. Amen. Thank you for the opportunity, Shane. Thanks for listening to Upstream with Shane Morris. For resources and more commentary on Christianity and culture, visit colsoncenter.org. Upstream with Shane Morris is a production of the Colson Center Podcast Network.